Good evening, everyone. Um, and depending on where you are in the world, good morning or good afternoon to you. Um, I'd like to welcome you once more to um, EAR, which stands for Ecclesia Africanos Reformanda. Can I ask everyone uh, to see if they can mute their microphone for the time being? I can pick up some feedback in the background. Um, and uh, if you've been following Hope and Ministries for a while, then you probably already know what EAR is about. Our goal is to initiate conversations um, towards the possible transformation of the African church, primarily because of the uh, challenges that we see in the church today. Um, so EAR started last year, um, and we've been having different kinds of conversations, specifically around the church. Uh, and uh, we're happy to report that um, it is evolving very fast into a learning platform for, um, like I like to say, people who take their community very seriously. Um, we've encountered people from different corners of the world, and um, we've been told that it's been very impactful. So in the last two sessions, i.e. June in the June and then July editions of the ER, we have been talking about Pentecostalism. And this is because it's the dominant force um, on the African continent when it comes to church. So we haven't just been talking about Pentecostalism, we've been talking about Pentecostalism and Neo-Pentecostalism, or what you will know as the charismatic movement. Um, with a focus on Africa. And our brother from um, Nigeria, um, Grace Bible Church in Lagos, Pastor Nwoko Sinochi, um, who's been a, a very supportive brother to this ministry um, since we met him, um, has done a fantastic job by helping build um, our understanding of uh, the Pentecostal movement, um, as we move towards this, what we're going to do today, which is the treatment, the comparison between the Pentecostal theology and the reformed theology that may have given birth to it in, in, in quotes. So Pastor Sinachi took us to Azusa Street and um, brought us back to Ghana and Nigeria, where we dealt with several issues around what led to the um, the, the foundation of the Pentecostal movement and then the later new Pentecostal movement that came out of it. So we've had the chance to talk about AICs, African independent churches like the Aladura and then in Ghana, what you might know as the Awoyo Church um, and the Muzama Disco Cristo Church, um, white robe churches. We've had an opportunity to learn about um, churches like uh, um, uh, the Apostolic Church, the Fosco Gospel, which are the classic Pentecostal churches. Um, but we also learn about what you might call progenitors of these kinds of, I mean, sorry, the, the, the churches that will later be known as the AIs, AIC. So we introduced to specific figures like the um, William Wade Harris or the Black Elijah, um, whose ministry started way before um uh, the pentecostal uh, the european and, and slash american pentecostal churches um even touch foods on the soil so it's a setting um uh foundation that was developed by these independent prophet-like preachers who uh, were already doing their thing within the west african space um that kind of identified well with with the uh, the kind of Christianity that the Pentecostals brought along. So today we are going to be looking at what the difference is between that type of Christianity and the reformed Christ reform Christianity that um, came out of the um, uh, the separation from Roman Catholicism, what you know are the Protestant movement. Um, how have we arrived at Pentecostal churches when the theology that gave birth to the Protestant movement that Pentecostalism is supposed to be a part of um, 
is so different? Or maybe is it really different? We're going to find out today um, as Pastor uh, Reverend Anthony Bentun Eni um, leads us in today's conversation. Reverend um, Bentun is not new to this platform. He spoke at um, SD21 um, earlier this year and um, did a fine job um, helping us to understand sound doctrine and its importance um, in the Christian space. We're looking forward to SD22, which we hope will be um, a live in-person event in Ghana. We are believing that um, God willing, he'll be there with us. Um, Let's pray quickly and then we will begin. Father, we thank you once more for another opportunity like this to be gathered in your presence. I want to um, honor you for the brothers that you have gathered here today. Um, as we begin, we're praying for your divine presence as usual. We're trusting, we're entrusting our leader um, and facilitator tonight into your hands. Um, we know, Lord, that you have used him to accomplish mighty things in the past. Um, and we're trusting in your confidence that today, too, you will use him to bring a deeper understanding of your faith um, to those who need who need it from all around the world. We're committing all our friends, all our partners, our supporters from all over the world, that wherever they are, Lord, you will guide their feet so that um, they will join us here. And then ultimately, your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So oh, man. that was a brief background to uh, what, we're, what we've done before should give us a uh, context as to what we're going to be doing today. Um, without wasting too much time, I'd like to open the floor uh, for uh, Reverend Anthony Bentum to, to begin this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I, I'd like to read from a very popular verse, which is a Second Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The Reformation, as you may have heard, was an attempt to return to scripture and for that matter, the teachings of scripture. For over 1000 years, there had been such a great darkness over the world so that, uh, that that is not to say that there were no witnesses, faithful witnesses at all, but the fact was that faithful witnesses were being persecuted and so uh, were really operating underground, if you, if you like. So it, the Lord had used a number of them to um, sound some measure of alarm. Uh, many of them had to uh, suffer with their lives because of that. But eventually, by the mercy of God, there was that mighty outbreak through Martin Luther. He was actually supported and helped by a number of persons, but he became the, 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 uh, the man in the front. And so uh, the Lord brought about the Reformation. Now, the Reformation was emphasizing five particular things. So we often call them the five soles. Sola, S-O-L-A-S, uh, the Latin for only. So there were these uh, five things that were emphasized. And that is what I want to go through them very quickly. And then I will try to show that it is these very things that gradually, it didn't happen overnight, but gradually Pentecostal movement began to undermine. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't seem to be deliberate, but as the Bible always warns, if we move away a step from truth, well, it doesn't take long at all. And the, first, the one step becomes a thousand. And so that is what happened. 
So the five solas or the five onlys are first of all the emphasis that there has to be for Christian life there is only one recognized authority and that is the scripture. So they say the scripture alone. As against at the time the Roman Catholic teaching where both tradition and what they call the magisterium that is the decision of the of the pope at the time with those the cardinals around him or what the church would represent the roman catholic church would teach at the time uh, they equated them to scripture our forefather said scripture alone by that in all the five solas i must mention that they meant uh, they had their minds on salvation as well as uh, the life of the Christian and the ordering of churches and, and how Christians uh, uh, behaved. And so it began, as I said, with the teaching that you have scripture alone. And I read this passage and I tried to read a number of uh, some of these passages so that uh, we would just refresh ourselves that these things were not taken by our fathers. They are clearly uh, taught out in scripture. So we must uh, uh, see them as such. Scripture alone says that we must bring ourselves, we are called as people to recognize scripture alone as the authority, God's authority and nothing else. Not human opinions, not human ideas, not what anybody thought was wonderful, but only what scripture taught and that uh, it is only in scripture that we will find the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, that was the emphasis. And they said that scripture was sufficient. And this part is very important because it will be the beginning of the troubles uh, when we begin to think of uh, the charismatic and Pentecostal movements. The scripture alone, scripture must judge everything. Scripture must judge everything the church did or anything that claimed the name Christian. Only uh, scripture must um, judge everything. Now, the second thing in the five solas is that uh, it is Christ alone, the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Again, this is about salvation first, that in God's salvation, we only look to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only Lamb of God that was slain for us. He is the only one sent of the Father. And we would stress his person first. We say that the work that he came to do, if he was not God, he would not have been able to achieve that. So his deity is emphasized, the fact that he is God. And as well as his humanity, because that was necessary for uh, him to die. If he didn't have uh, human nature, he could not have died. And so uh, this is again uh, another important, let me just read you uh, one or two passages uh, to let you see how important this is. So Apostle Paul said this um, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so the apostle Paul wanted to see this in the churches and, and uh, his concern was about Christ as uh, seen and uh, believed. And also when we speak of Christ alone, we also think about uh, the fact that everything must submit to Christ. That's the purpose of salvation that all, all persons who ever uh, would find the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ must uh, submit to him. And so um, there's that passage where Apostle Paul said that we may bring every thought to, into obedience of Christ. And so we emphasize that too. The third is what we call grace alone. Again, it has to start with salvation. We say that salvation has to be by grace alone. In other words, we cannot do anything to earn God's favor or to make ourselves acceptable in his sight. If we will be accepted, it has to be by God's grace. That is, he must, for the sake of Christ, receive us. 
that he would look upon what Christ has done and the sinner who puts his confidence and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is received only for the sake of Christ. Nothing of what he himself can do. It is grace alone. Now it also goes on in the Christian life, we insist. We say that in the Christian life, um, the, the, the child of God, the Christian believes that he has to uh, uh, he has to be supported by the Lord. He has no strength of his own. And that the grace of God must continue in his life, upholding, strengthening, and enabling him to live as a Christian. And so grace alone is also an important uh, element in Reformed teaching. So uh, uh, by the grace of God, we also want to stress the fact that this grace also carries with it that enabling effect. Sometimes we think of grace only as, uh, as uh, undeserving favor, unmerited favor, which is correct. But there is the other element of enabling favor. And this is taught in Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared unto all men, and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness. That grace that appears must be seen. And it is the emphasis of our forefathers and of Reformed teaching that grace is not something you only talk about. Grace must be seen. The work of grace in the heart must bear such fruit as is visible that can be seen and proved. And so if a person doesn't have what we call the marks of grace, he dare not call himself a Christian. So if I say that I've come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we say the Savior you came to is alive. And because he's alive, he received you. And when he received you, he promises that every person who came to him, he will work in his heart or his or her heart. Did he work in your heart? Did he give you, did he receive you to himself? Did he wash away your sins? Did he put in you that new nature to make you willing and glad in obeying him and so we stress about uh, grace alone we also talk about faith alone the two go hand in hand as the apostle clearly teaches in ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 for the grace of god I beg your pardon for by grace are we saying through faith so um by grace we say through faith so they go hand in hand he says uh, makes a similar statement in romans chapter 3 also uh, so faith also is another aspect faith alone when I come to the Pentecostals, I'll try to explain that the faith is entirely misunderstood in their midst. Faith, we say, it's that grace that is given to the sinner to see in the Lord Jesus Christ all he ever needed. He sees in the Lord Jesus Christ righteousness and sanctification and acceptance with God. He finds the Lord Jesus Christ the treasure above all else. And uh, he yields to Christ, knowing that in him he has everything that is truly worthy of being called a thing. And so uh, faith alone uh, includes the abandonment of all confidence in self, all confidence in ourselves or whatever we can do. It reminds you of that, of that passage in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. The Apostle Paul, speaking of us who are Christians, Philippians chapter 3, and verse 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We put no confidence in ourselves, what we can do, what we can achieve to let God approve of us or uh, be interested in us because we have nothing attractive to God. We insist upon that. And we say that this faith makes me entirely lean upon the Savior, rest all my hopes upon what he did, on Calvary and on nothing else. This faith, if it is true, we would insist, if it is true, enables this person now to live a life of faith. What does that mean? It means that this person is brought to a point where he takes God's word seriously. He takes God's word seriously that this word regulates every aspect of his life because he believes that only this word portrays or gives him the mind of god and therefore it is that which regulate his life so that its promises he can embrace the promises in this word the commands in the bible in god's word uh, he feels himself obliged to obey the the uh, teachings of the word 
shapes his worldview. And so it is not, it's not a kind of a, a only saying, I believe, but it is this faith that entirely transforms a person's worldview. And so we say this faith alone bring us to God, bring us to any uh, conscious relationship with him. And the last one, it's not the last, but in the last of the five, is that to God's glory alone, soli Dio gloria, for God's glory alone. We say the salvation was designed for God's glory only. It is God only who must be glorified in salvation. He purposed it, he executed it, he brings it to pass in the hearts of individuals, and he alone is the one that will be glorified in our salvation when he has finally brought every person who came to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to glory when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And then this continues also, as I've tried to mention, continues also through life, that we say there's essence of the Christian life is to glorify God. You may have heard of the, uh, uh, the catechism that became popular in reform circles. There's the question posed, so what is the chief end of man or chief purpose of man? And the answer is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And so uh, we say that we must glorify God in the sense that everything we do, he, he must be seen so that he will be loved he will be obeyed, he will be known, and he will be uh, worshipped and revered above all. So uh, we see that in scripture, God is, is glorified in two chief ways. First, in the conversion of sinners, when unbelievers turn to the Savior. And the second is when believers are maturing in holiness, when godliness is deepening and entrenching itself in us, then God is glorified in these things. And so we say that uh, everything, the salvation which God purposed, as well as the entire Christian life was intended for God's glory. And so this is what should be aimed at. The glory of God should be the sole pursuit of Christians and of churches that belong, that truly belong to the Lord. Now, there is an element which was not usual, is not usually put into the solace because we would say that it runs through all of them. It is possibly part of the reason why um, people misunderstood uh, reformers or reform teaching, because some people said that, oh, they do not believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, um, this is the element that it's, it's, it's an important part because we would say, we would talk about the Holy Spirit, but because the Lord Jesus Christ uh, decidedly told us that the Holy Spirit will point to him, we say that the Holy Spirit is at work in all these elements. Let me try to explain. For example, if we think of the scripture alone, we say it is the Holy Spirit who brings understanding. Because by understanding scriptures, we do not only mean that when I read the Bible, I can just make sense out of it and say, oh, this is what it is saying. That's part, that's important. But we say that there has to be that capacity to see in this word, to see in the scriptures, the things that I'm reading, that this is the very mind of God. So as that it moves me and it takes hold of me. And I cannot go away from that. And we say that comes by the Holy Spirit. That is what First John chapter 2 calls it, the anointing of God. The Holy Spirit is sent so that he will bring us to this understanding so that in scripture we may see the things God has shown us there. We also say that only the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us because when I come as a sinner, when I see myself, let's try to uh, um, put them in a kind of an order. If I read the scriptures and I see my sinfulness, you know, I do not naturally turn from it. Naturally, like the prodigal son, naturally we begin to build excuses. Naturally, we try to improve a little here and there and perhaps even take on a little religion so as to appease my conscience that everything is okay. That is us, that's human beings. And so we do not really 
uh, begin to turn to God. But it is the work of the Spirit to bring us to feel the hopelessness of whatever we can do and to help us to see that only Christ has died and he only can bring us to spiritual life. After all, he is the one who is described as the one who brings spiritual life into the soul. It is the spiritual life that makes me aware of the spiritual things I'm dealing with and of God whom I'm dealing with. Otherwise, I can look upon my sons and the wrong things I do and merely think as a kind of a character issue, which I know probably I would overcome when I grow up, things like this. Uh, but it is only when the Holy Spirit brings that conviction through the word that I run to Christ. And we say that we feel a need of grace again by the work of the Spirit. How can I see that I have nothing? And I can do nothing. The Pharisee they only need Christ and what did. And so he works to bring us another uh, work of the Spirit, bringing us to see the grace of the word of faith. There's, there's no one can believe without the aid of the Spirit. Again, if what, will, what is it that will bring me to sincerely embrace the things that the Bible teaches? This is not of nature. The natural man cannot that isn't it? The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit because they are spiritually discerned. Only the Holy Spirit brings me to believe the things of God sincerely, to read the Bible and for it to grip my heart and to say that now I rest my hopes upon the things taught here. Only the Holy Spirit works this. And then he enables us as he teaches us, as we learn of God's word, and as he teaches me, uh, well, I, you and I, if we are Christians, begin to realize that our lives must glorify God alone. And so, friends, this is a kind of a nutshell of, uh, uh, um, of, the, of the Reformed, uh, fundamentals of Reformed teaching. Now, you would realize that any Christian will believe this. You cannot think of any Christian uh, doubting any of these five plus the other aspect I read about the Holy Spirit. You cannot think of any Christian uh, turning away from this. And so what happened? What happened that we began to have Pentecostalism, which gradually, as I, as I say again, it, well, it didn't happen overnight, but gradually shifted away and away from these things so that, um, so that uh, we are where we are now with charismatics. Now, um, let me start by saying that the old Pentecostals, when I was a young person, this is in the 80s, and uh, I was still a member of the Baptist Church, the Baptist Convention Baptist Church, a young man. Um, we used to have meetings, joint church meetings, and people from the Assemblies of God would come. And sometimes we would go there also. I think it was a, it was a kind of a, 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 a singing groups and we'll have a common, a, 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 perhaps a, a meetings to, to sing from various groups to sing. And um, the, the thing that was said always was this, that both Baptists, now I know the Baptists now are different, especially the Convention Baptist churches are different. So I'm really going back to the Convention Baptist churches of the 80s and even before. But uh, at the time, it, was, it could be said that the, the, the Baptists and the Assemblies of God were the same in virtually everything. The only thing they differed in was the gifts of the Spirit, speaking with tongues and things like this. And so uh, it was very clear. So I say this to show that the five solas and the other aspect of the work of the Spirit was, was I mean, you cannot think of any serious-minded Christian denying this. And so what happened? Now, what happened was, and I, I believe that uh, uh, Pastor Sinachi may have touched on, this, on that, one of the things that happened 
was the gradual exaltation of experience over scripture. I remember even in those days, mature Christians were saying that loud. Don't exalt experience about scripture. Scripture must judge everything. But you see, when somebody claims I've had an experience, and he's, he feels so warm about that, and he's, he's in for it, and it is everything to him, and he claims to have changed his life, and things like that. Now, um, unless, unless um, his, his uh, commitment to scripture is very solid, he's bound to follow that experience. And so he began with the question about the sufficiency of scripture. That's the problem number one. Is scripture sufficient? The very moment you understand that and, and embrace that, then you begin to see the problems with Pentecostalism and charismatism. But at the time, it seemed that people could still say that they were, they, they believed in the sufficiency of scripture, yet at the same time, their experience was also true. Even though sometimes those experiences they were talking about was evidently far off from scripture. And yet people would want to keep both. And even now, don't people do it? People will claim uh, respect for scripture and things, and yet uh, they'll be, they will be doing things that they are not willing to check and see if this is what the Bible teaches. You know, this is human nature, and we are all very weak, and uh, the, the, the danger is there for all of us. It speaks to all of us, you know, and warns all of us, because um, 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 if we are not careful, we can all uh, fall in, in, in the same direction. So uh, it began with this, as I mentioned, it began with uh, this exaltation of experience about scripture. And so when I, um, I was praying and I had this warm feeling and I had a voice speaking to me and, and, and it gave me some direction and it felt so real. Well, then the person took that seriously and was reluctant to check and say, is this what the Bible teaches? And so began the problem. And so gradually, my dear friends, the trouble with Pentecostalism and charismatism, as we speak of it now, is a, a gradual departure virtually from all these solas, all of them. In fact, there's not one of them that the charismatic church, the mainline charismatic churches today can truly consistently claim that they hold on to. I say consistently because there's one thing paying lip service to something and it's another thing uh, letting uh, coming under the rule and being influenced by that. Let me try to explain what I mean by that. In what sense have um, Pentecostals and Charismatics moved away from these fundamentals of the Reformation teaching. If you take scripture, for example, we have insisted, and our forebears have insisted that when you talk about the sufficiency of scripture, you cannot, on the one hand, accept the sufficient scripture and at the same time accept ongoing prophecy. Now, there has been a attempt to try to put the two together but we believe it has never been successful neither can it ever be because that the scripture is sufficient simply means that in the bible god has given us everything we needed to govern us our lives our churches and whatever we want to do there's no room for us to invent things of our own because god either in direct words in example or in principle had taught us what needs to be done and so when you bring in prophets and prophecy, and these persons must be listened to, then we say, well, where do you place the scripture and, and the so-called prophet? Where do you place it? If what he's saying is already in the Bible, then why does he call himself a prophet? He should rather tell you what I'm saying is in such and such a place in the Bible. If what he's saying is not in the Bible, then he's a heretic. He isn't speaking as a Christian, and he must not be taken seriously as a Christian. So where do you place them? In, in God's dealings with his people, in God teaching his people, there's no room for a secondary authority 
where you can say, okay, let's accept the Bible as the first supreme authority. And let's allow the prophet something like a secondary authority. No, there's no room like that because we, we are called to listen to only one voice, that of the scripture alone. Um, you know that passage in uh, Prophet Isaiah chapter 8, it's, uh, one of the passages we often refer to when we're thinking of the sufficiency uh, of scripture. Let me, permit me to read this. My time is running on, and I'm aware of that. Um, so Prophet Isaiah chapter 8, and I think it's uh, verses uh, 19 and 20. Prophet Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards and that people, and that matter, should not have people seek unto their God. For the living to the dead is the extreme case, of course, of uh, going to seek a familiar spirit, but going elsewhere apart from God. But look at the contrast in verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And so we insist that there's no way you can marry a sufficient scripture with an ongoing ministry of prophecy. Now, let me go on to Christ. Well, you would say, oh, they also talk about Christ, friends. They may have obviously departed from some of these fundamentals that others, others would be more obvious than others. But friends, I contend that uh, the main line charismatic groups, they may be individuals in their midst who still respect these things and strangely find themselves at home in such places. We can allow for that. But as per their, as per their way of uh, doing things and practice, we say they even deny Christ. You would say this is a huge charge. I'm aware of that, dear friends. In what sense? Because, you see, we speak of Calvary alone. The Lord Jesus Christ came to give his life on the cross of Calvary. And that the sinner who repents of sin and turns to him finds life. Now, do you hear repentance being preached in charismatic churches, in Pentecostal churches? It is uncomfortable. They don't like it. But the fact is, no repentance, no sense of shame, they cannot be genuinely trust in Christ. The sinner can only trust Christ because he feels miserable and he knows that there's nothing he can do and that his case is alarming and then he's willing to flee to the Savior. And so if you will not insist upon repentance, and in fact, as the, as the Apostle Paul uh, often does, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself did, remember when he was speaking in, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, when he really was touching on heart sins, not just the outward demeanor or misdemeanor and things like this, but also the heart sins. Then when people see their wretchedness, then they flee to the Savior. When you think, you can simply tell people, if you want to give your life to Christ, raise your hand. And, and that settles it, dear friends. They have no such example in the Bible. No such example. And even more seriously, do they not practice deliverance ministry? Now, what does the deliverance ministry supposed to do? What did the Lord Jesus Christ do on the cross of Calvary? When he saves a person, what does he do with him? What does he do in him? And what is the deliverance ministry supposed to contribute to that person? You see, so it have introduced something that really undermines a very fundamental thing they may purport to believe. And so that is a serious case also. And then, you see, and this may be mentioned another time also, that when they build people's hopes upon wealth, and when they think that nations depend upon wealth, this is totally antichrist. We say the nations depend on the Lord. They need the Lord. They need Christ. They need to find him and be brought to him. And they are so busy training their members to become wealthy materially. Well, friends, uh, this is, of course, as I said, they can be one on the one hand, a lip service, and on the other, a real concrete denial of the very thing they may be saying with their lips. And so, 
By this teaching, no, you remember that when uh, Pentecostal uh, teaching started, it didn't start with some of these. So this has been gradual, you see, and the, the warning that uh, many of the mature Christians were given at the time has really been fulfilled that go off from scripture, one thing of scripture, one thing of fundamental value in scripture, eventually you will end up throwing away so many more. And this is exactly what has happened. How have they undermined grace? Well, if you will not teach repentance, you cannot truly talk about, about grace. Grace works hand in hand with uh, repentance because the person who uh, feels a sense, his need of grace, feels a sense of nothingness. And uh, he, he feels that he can do nothing. He's, he's a totally uh, uh, a ruined person. Only the grace of God can bring him to himself. Do you hear these things spoken about and insisted upon? Oh, friends. And um, one practical thing, very, very frequent uh, in reform, and in, I beg your pardon, in charismatic uh, circles that really undermines anything like this when they, uh, they, they are eager to exalt supposedly big people in this world rather than godly people. Well, the grace of God magnifies godliness and not earthly status, my dear friends. Now, what about faith? They seem to make a lot of noise about faith, and yet the faith they talk about is actually um, not the kind in scripture. The faith they talk about is a, your own strong mental determination and unyielding resolve that something must be obtained, something must be yours. Of course, that is not what the Bible calls faith. Faith always waits for promise. Is there a clear promise of God to that effect? If there's no clear promise of God, faith says, I trust in the person of God, God's kindness, God's power, God's wisdom to choose for me that which he thinks is wise and good. And so faith, faith that brings me to Christ, making me lean entirely upon what he did on Calvary. No, it's not mere mental acceptance of these ideas. It is truly embracing them. And uh, 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 yielding to them so that my heart is fixed upon God's promises. You know, faith destroys self-confidence. My dear friend, you may not know, the whole world talks about self-confidence. The Christian doesn't need self-confidence. He only needs confidence in God. He needs trust in God, and that's enough for him. You know, worldlings need to really push themselves up and tell themselves, hey, I can do it, hey, I can do it. The apostle says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So you see, if Christ will withhold his strength, I can do nothing. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of himself as one who has taken our nature and on earth said that, of myself I can do nothing, but as I see my Father do, so do I. Is that not amazing, my dear friends? Everything is turned upside down. And so, friends, faith also is undermined, and it is no longer. You remember, um, uh, let me just use this as an example. You remember the, 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 popular, the popular statements that God has, has promised that his people must be the head and not the day. I always think that it is, it is one of the most betrayals, uh, clearest betrayals of charismatic teaching. Because, you see, when God speaks about headship, is he talking about headship in terms of earthly status? And uh, so think of it, see the contradiction. How can Almighty God who invites us to imitate him and live, up and live in godliness and deny ourselves of this world now regards putting you in, in, in on top of the things of this world as headship? No, the headship that God promised was Israel's influence, the godly influence he would have given them over the nations around, so that these nations would have run to Israel to learn about their God. Because, you know, that beautiful verse that um, Moses told the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 4, he said that, what a wonderful person, people you are, Israel, that you have such a God who is so near. You know what he added? That you have set commandments, so pure, so good, given unto you. It is our lives. It's the fact that we live under the rule of scripture that will put us on top of the world so that the people realize the peace 
is found in godliness, not in wealth. It's found in a dedicated life to Christ, not in abundance. Because no man's life, the Lord Jesus said that in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, when he came uh, eventually to the parable of the rich fool, the man's life does not consist in abundance of things he possesses. You see, there's a total contradiction there, isn't it? And then that the other one, that everything must glorify Christ. Well, friends, how are churches ordered now? The so-called visionary in the charismatic church is the man who started. Is the is the is the is the uh, what do you call it? The, is the is the um, uh, the general overseer? He is the one who's caught the vision. You know, churches don't have their own visions. The Lord Jesus has written them in His Bible alone already. We only comply to them. And so you see, the man caught the vision. He wants to arrive at it. No, we are obedient people. We want to understand the word and obey it and reflect upon that, uh, my dear friends. As so everything must glorify God means that he must be noticed. Remember the statement of John the Baptist in uh, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 3? He must increase and I must decrease. John said that. Um, so the Lord Jesus Christ, I beg your pardon, I think Luke chapter 3, uh, he must increase. Oh, sorry, John. I'm sorry. Sorry for confusing you. Please, I want to read that because I'm, I'm confusing you and myself also. It's in, um, I believe it's the Gospel of John, please. Uh, and that man, remember that the Lord Jesus Christ called him uh, the, the, the greatest among men, uh, that um, men, of, men born of women, uh, he is such a, such a, a great man. And so uh, he, John spoke, my dear friends, I really didn't prepare to read this one. Let me see, friends, I'll find it out for you, but I, I, I'm sure you know the statement. He must increase and I must decrease. Uh, John said that, and that's the purpose of, uh, and that's the purpose of all our work. When we want to glorify the Lord, we want him to be seen and we not seen. He must be noticed and not us. We are only servants. Apostle Paul says that um, I want Christ to be seen. We preach Christ and him crucified and ourselves, your servants, for Christ's sake, because you know Christ only must be seen. It's, uh, it's John's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 30. I'm sorry. John's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. You cannot have two persons all exalted. Us, ministers of the gospel, only must stand and point to Christ. Behold the Lamb that was slain, the Lamb of God that was slain. And when we have done that, so that people sense their need of him, that we have done our work, we are not great men in ourselves. We are servants for Christ's sake. And so he alone must be glorified and must be honored. Now, what about the work of the Spirit? We say again, it's only a lip service. Now, the kind of things a charismatic group claim the Holy Spirit does well, of course, uh, those things you will have to say that at best you don't see them as the work of the Spirit. For example, when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of the Spirit's coming in uh, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 16, he spoke very clearly of some uh, fundamental things the Holy Spirit would do. We were told, for example, that he would convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Why? Why is it that in the place where the Holy Spirit is shouted down, there's no conviction of sin? And there's no longing for righteousness. And there's no sense that we need the righteousness of Christ. Friends, something is dubious here. And so you see, over time, there has been a consistent undermining of these very fundamentals which every Christian ever embraced every Christian ever accepted. They have entirely thrown all these things away. And now they are on their own. Friends, the sad thing is they are on their own now. They cannot have scripture on their side. They cannot have the Holy Spirit on their side. And for that sake, we fear to say, they do not have Almighty God on their side either. And so sadly, my dear friend, these things are not pleasant things to say. They are in understanding deserted churches, no longer places where the city is on it. We again say there may be individual Christians there. 
who still somehow manage to feed on a little here and there they may hear, but by and large, the Lord is denied them. And so my dear friends, I think that given the fact that this is only a single treatment, uh, perhaps this is the best I can do in terms of uh, looking at the fundamentals. If I were to branch into others, perhaps we can look at others too. So friends, I'll start to speak for 15 minutes and I'm done. I would want to pause here and uh, I'd be willing to take some questions, if any. Thank you very much. At least I cannot hear Brother Kati. My apologies, I, I was still muted. I tend to do that a lot. <laughs> um, first, I want to say thank you very much for making the time to join us today and to um, share on this particular subject. Um, I think that your presentation has touched on some of the most important issues um, that charismatics themselves raise when um, they occasionally encounter um, reform theology uh, people, so to speak. And some of the issues that I think has to do with the deliverance, um, the emphasis on wealth, um, and then the issue of visions. Um, so I'm gonna ask a couple of questions around that whilst we wait for others to, to ask questions. Deliverance is an area where people have whole ministries built um, um, around it. And so um, the idea that it is not something that we should be doing as Christian tends to be problematic for them. Um, can you talk us through that particular issue? Because so often what we see is that somebody goes to church the Holy Spirit supposedly um, comes yeah. down. Um, somebody mm -hmm. lays hands on them. They start jumping all over the place and start making some confessions about um, things that they have done or what a time they say that they are manifesting. Or what a time Satan speaks to them and then you see the pastor interacting with whatever demon is inside of them. And then eventually the, the, uh, the spirit is driven out. Now, this is often compared to what Christ supposed Christ himself did in the Bible when he cast out demons um, um, from people who were who were suffering from de demonic afflictions. How please talk us through what the right situation will be. What's wrong with what we see on a regular basis, and what's the right way around this particular problem? Yeah, thank you very much. The very first thing is that in the scriptures, uh, demon possession was very clear it wasn't ambiguous the demon in dwelling the person gave the person extraordinary capabilities one of it could be the capacity to speak about people's lives he hasn't met them like we have in acts chapter 16 or the capacity to have such extraordinary strength as we find in mark 5 the man that the lord jesus christ has cast out the legion from um, you see the extraordinary strength he had. Now, so we insist that dim, clear, genuine demon possessed case are very clear. They are not ambiguous. The person would know, his family would know that this person is possessed with extraordinary things which they cannot explain. It, it, will, it will not be a normal person. He comes to a meeting, and suddenly something comes in and he's shaking and then the interpretation is that he's demon possessed. And he himself doesn't even know anything like that. Well, you don't have an example like that in scripture because the truth is that how would the other person also agree even that, well, this is my case. So th that's the first thing. The second is that in the case of a real, so now let me mention this before I go to that. The Bible teaches that when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, a mighty, work was done. And that work was that Satan no longer had the capacity to possess people at his own will. Before the, the Lord Jesus Christ died and the nations were in darkness, that's why the Lord Jesus Christ said that uh, now with the, uh, John chapter 12, um, 
Uh, and now is the time of judgment. Now will the prince of this world be cast out. Uh, then when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men, all people from all nations, he meant, unto myself. What he did was that Satan's power was mightily curtailed. And he, he confirms that in Ephesians 4. Does it mean that demon possession doesn't occur? It does occur to people who deliberately get into things we call spiritism. But when people have not thrown themselves into these things, Satan cannot himself come and possess. The big question is, Satan is such a wicked affair. He, he, he's no friend of anybody. If he has the liberty to in, uh, fill anybody with demons, why, hasn't, why has he not given you and I our seven demons by now? Especially those of us who are preachers. So he, he finished us right at the beginning, wasn't it? So he does not have that power. Uh, uh, because he's mightily restrained. Why is he not 100% restrained? But because the Savior will finish him off when he comes the second time. <clears throat> so should we meet a real demon, demon possessed case, a real one? Not somebody's came to church and is shaking and things like that, and then we are calling a demon possessed. Should we face a real one? We say, we point this person to Christ. Because you see, it is only the gospel that will set this person free. Remember, the Lord Jesus gave a parable and said, when a demon is cast out of a person, he goes and roams, and then he comes back to look at where he was, and he finds the place now neat and well kept. Then he brings in even seven more that are more wicked than himself, and he takes over the person. So the Lord was using that to teach, first of all, uh, to warn the Jews that a mere moral, moral reformation isn't enough. Eventually, you'll be, you'll be far worse. Because, for example, you become so incurably proud. But the, illust the illustration itself teaches us that unless the heart is owned by someone who is coming to take permanent residence, the person is not safe. So should we be able, let's assume that we be able to just, without bringing the person to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, cast out the devil, and the person never became a Christian? Well, According to that, what the law said, the person actually may become worse off eventually because the devil may come back again and take over. And so this is what we'll say. Now, let me give a personal uh, uh, testimony about this kind of thing. There was a time that they brought a young, a young lady to me and uh, they had told her uh, that uh, she had a demon in her. And in fact, uh, an uncle, uh, had, had come to try and deliver her. And the, the lady had begun to say that she is her mother. In other words, the mother is a demon within her, now speaking and saying, mention her mother's name, saying, I am, if the mother is saying Auntie Kay, she's been, she began to say, I am Auntie Kay, I'm Auntie Kay. And because I believe that is not true, I told her straight forward that what you are saying is not true. Stop it. And she stopped. Um, the truth is that if you take the line that, that because the person is saying, because the person is saying, I am demon possessed, I'm also going to take him on as a demon possessed. No doctor does that. You go to hospital, you go, I knew a doctor when you went to the hospital and told him, you, you only have to tell him the symptoms and he will tell you what's wrong with you. But if you went to tell him that I have, I have typhoid, you say, well, go and treat yourself. You're supposed to know better. Because if a person came and said, Pastor, I'm demon possessed, you know the scripture, sit the person down, take her through these things. I've had a lady who uh, was told that she, her mother was, uh, because she was having dreams where somebody's having an affair with her, and uh, the deliverance people have told her that it was her mother. And so the link between her and the mother was a dinner set she was given when, when uh, she was marrying and, and that had been brought to be smashed so that there would be no connection whatsoever. And then we sat the person down and tried to tell the world, this is what these people are saying, but that's not what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible teaches. And then eventually she was set free and then the dreams themselves vanished. And so, dear friend, my point is that if we believe what the Bible teaches and we taught people it, we will see the Lord bless it. Thank you very much um, for, for that, Reverend. You have killed 
um, a whole ministry um, with, oh, no. <laughs> with a five, five minute presentation. Um, this is probably one of the most common things um, um, in our charismatic church. And I think, you know, based on something that Pastor um, Osinachi said in his presentation, it may have something to do with um, our own worldview as Africans, given the background we come from. Yes. When something is wrong with yes. somebody, um, yes. typically yes. you have to go and find yes. something, demon that is yes. causing it, yes. and you have to chase it yes. out. So even yes. the fetish priests were doing that already. Or, or, or already, um, and we've just managed it to squeeze it into into Christianity, and it, it doesn't belong there. Um, so, um, so I guess in effect, what you're saying is that when somebody is truly possessed, because you have said mm. that um, a person can be truly possessed if they are involved in some kind of spiritism, yes. the way out of that particular situation is to is to teach them um, the true word of God, and that's what's capable of. I'm saving them from, from the challenge. Thank you very much for that. Um, let me just remind all, all of us that um, this is a roundtable conference, so it means that you can ask questions, you can make comments, you can make contributions on what have been said. So if you are with us here on StreamYard, please um, feel free to, to, to share your comments, your views, um, and ask questions. And um, so we can have that conversation. But if you're on Facebook or YouTube, if you post a question, we will see it. We will read it to um, Reverend Mentum and the brothers in the house, and hopefully we'll be able to get you um, some answers. Um, I know that this is a big issue, especially what we just said about um, deliverance. It's a big issue for all of us Africans. So yeah. if you have a question, please post it. And if you have a, a comment, please share it with us. Um, um, I'm detecting a movement from um, Brother Sinachi. I, I, I wonder if you had a contribution to make to what Reverend Benton has said. Oh, not at all. I think he has, he has done more than a good job. So I'm just here to listen. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Okay, so Reverend Benton, you made an import, important point um, during your presentation when you said that um, we must not exalt experience of, uh, um, scripture. Um, so that's kind of really what we see a lot, a lot of so this issue of deliverance um, is is an experience issue, isn't it? People always want to feel something, and I think that people are attracted into churches when they hear that. You know, last week when we went to church, somebody was jumping all over the place. They were breaking chairs, and they were saying that they were seeing something. The pastor laid his hand on him, and um, um, and, and and it went away. Um, please talk to us a little bit more about this experience issue. In what other ways um, are people subscribing to experience and exalting it over, over scripture? Uh, this, this comes in various forms, and we, we really have to um, warn ourselves. You know, all of us are in danger, and we, uh, you know, the charismatics, the kind of charismatic experience goes in the form of uh, maybe deliverance and others, but perhaps we can all fall into another kind. So I want to make that point first. Now, mm. uh, the, the trouble is that um, if I think I have experienced something, gone into some spiritual encounter or something like that, you are bound to feel very strong about that. And especially if the person is sincere about that. And you do not want to question the person's sincerity. Only, as you all know, we tell people sincerity, as long as it means you are above error. Um, you may be sincere, but in error. And also that we say that sometimes, and one of the tricky parts is that sometimes the wrong experience May still, may still seem to have done some good. And so, mm -hmm. because it seems to have done some good, then we conclude that, oh, then, I think uh, this must be acceptable. And it is one of the big things that um, uh, lay off people. One of the scriptural examples we point out to is, uh, you remember when the second time the Lord instructed Moses to go and speak to the rock instead of striking it, 
to bring water for the people of Israel. You remember yeah. that we also yeah. insist that you see that the water did come because God wanted to give his people water. Then he told Moses, because you did not honor me before the people, I want to chastise you. And so this is why we say that even when that experience supposedly seemed to have done good to some people, we are still obliged to come back and say, but is that what the Bible teaches? Um, otherwise, um, see, it will lead you to another. You know, the one I did the last time, that experience that I had, oh, somebody else was held by it. Okay, so if I have another one today, and another person says, well, I'm held by it, then you keep going. But in actual fact, you actually strip uh, strain away from scripture. And that's, that's one of the things that made some of these experience uh, thing became a uh, path in charismatic churches. So, uh, well, he had that experience and he speaks about it and everybody uh, 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 claims that it is true. Please, if you permit a personal testimony in this again, you know, the, as a young Christian, I was involved in charismatism. And um, I remember I could be in a room and pray in tongues for about two hours. I remember this very distinctly. In the course of praying one time, uh, I thought that the Lord was speaking to me. And so, so I wrote it in a, in, a, in a book I had with me, like a diary, I wrote it there. And then two years later, I was, as I was flipping through the diary, I saw that writing and I began reading them again. I was so horrified. I said, come on, <laughs> whoever told you this can be of God. And yet at the time, it came with a sense of emotion and uh, the sweating and all this kind of thing. See, this is why the Apostle Paul instructs us that we should let our minds be active. God is, not give, God is giving us a sound mind. We must always keep the mind active to weigh matter, to reflect upon scriptures. What says the scripture? What says the scripture? If you put scripture first, eventually come bring whatever strong feeling under control. If you don't, they would overpower us and you have more and more and more of it and you think you are really flying in the, in the realms of the spirit when we're actually uh, doubling with devils, perhaps. Okay, so I guess you're saying it in fact that this, the, the, there might be a little room for experience within the Christian faith, but it is not to be emphasized. Oh, okay, sorry. No, no, let me let me clarify that. Let me clarify. I didn't I didn't get that. Surely Christian life is not a dry and uh only no, I mentioned that when I was speaking. The Christian has wonderful experiences, but what are mm. they? The kind of experiences we are taught in script we are we, we can expect are taught in scripture. For example, joy unspeakable and full of glory. What does that mean? And how does mm. it come? Is it that when I'm sitting down, suddenly I feel some sweetness in my heart, and then, well, unbelievers feel similar kind, kind of things. It comes first by reflection. I am reflecting on some scriptural theme, on some truths of the word, and the Holy Spirit enlightens my mind so that I begin to see its, its impact and its, its, uh, its richness beyond what I'd ever thought. And we are moved. Oh, yes, dear friends, sometimes the soul soars. Sometimes we are, it's like we are lifted up above this world. But what is happening is that we know what is causing it. We are giving understanding beyond our capacity. We are giving an appreciation of something the Bible has taught us beyond what we imagine. They are not something we are creating, but it has a clear source from the word and then it came by reflection you are reflecting upon these truths and the holy spirit enlarged them to us yes 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 we talk a lot about experience and there are many rich rich ones for example see it, it has various sides when they talk of the various experience why don't they talk about the sense of remorse when we are cast mm. down because of sin mm. and perhaps sins that nobody has seen perhaps I was bearing some hatred in my heart. I've not shown it in, I've not shown it forward oh, so that anybody sees it. It was all in my heart and I'm convicted of it. What about that? That's an experience. And I grieve over that. And I'm helped to look upon Christ afresh. 
And then the wonder of his own love melts my heart down. And I see the foolishness. For example, I cannot forgive somebody. Somebody has done me such a great wrong. And I'm very bitter. I'm finding it very difficult to, to forgive. And as I reflect upon the cross of Calvary and the love of Christ for me, as the Lord himself said, I began to see how small that offense is. And it melts yeah. me down that I'm so willing to forgive that person. Yes, these are scripture. And these are wonderful. And we have them. And we should have them. Thank you very much for that. I think that clarifies um, the, the, the issue. Now, so there's something else that I picked on, the issue of wealth. I think that's probably the big one. And um, often when you I have encountered, for want of a better expression, liberal theology-oriented people, um, they seem to project the idea that because the African continent is so deep with, is in poverty, we're poverty reading continent, the message of wealth and, and prosperity is important to create the mentality needed to get people out of poverty. They also argue that um, in order to get through to somebody who's hungry, you need to talk to them about food because that's where their mind is. And I think that this uh, substantial theology that's been built around this idea that's influencing how we're preaching messages in, in, in Pentecostal and charismatic <laughs> churches today. Um, what can you tell us about that? Is this a valid argument? Is God considerate of the suffering of, of poor people? And is he interested in... Oh, this, is, this, this, this is one of the favorite themes. You know, um, what kind of world did Christianity come into? Um, were there no poor persons? Or if I, mm. Comparatively, they were far poorer than we are. Why did they not? Why did not the apostles then preach wealth? In fact, let me read you, and this is a very perfect. Let me say this before I go on. All throughout the Bible, both the Lord and His apostles only warned against wealth. They warned strongly. Against wealth. Now, why? Because you see, wealth has a subtle way of turning a soul into hypocrites overnight. It can make you, now that, let me give an example. Now that I have a car and I can easily ride to church, I may seem very committed to church. But what rules the heart? Wealth divides the heart. It makes the person really never really love the Lord. Now, I will speak about the other side very soon. But this has to be stressed. Please let me read first, first Timothy 6. It's a very powerful passage. Um, First Timothy chapter 6, starting from verse 8, but, and having food and raiment or clothes, let us be there with content. So only basic things we are called to be content with. But they that will be rich, the word will, meaning make it their aim, make it their target. They that will be rich, fall, nor may be a certain, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hateful lusts would drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have heard from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows and then look at the contrast they are in this, but thou oh man of god flee these things Flee them. And then please look at uh, a statement of faith in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. So if they want to talk about faith, this is what faith says. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness. The Greek here is simply love of money. Let your conduct, conversation here means conduct. Let your conduct be without love of money, covetousness, and be content with such things as he has. For he has said, that's God, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, 
The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. This is what faith says. God is my helper. Some people think that contentment will lead to laziness. It's not true for the Christian. The problem is we are not teaching people the motivation from, for work as the Bible teaches it. The motivation for work for Jesus is not just me and my family. This is worldly. This is fleshly. This is unchristian. This is selfish. The motivation for, for work, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. He that has, verse 28, he that has stolen, let him steal no more, but let him work with his hands so that, what? He may be able to give unto others. Others. As the Christian who wants to be obedient to God says, God wants me to be hardworking. Laziness is sin. Idleness is sin. Conscience would disturb me. So get that poor person. Get him obey the Lord in hard working. The truth is, he will meet his needs. He will meet his needs. And yet, he's warned, be careful, don't set your eyes upon wealth because it will divide your heart. So it won't make him lazy. It will make him miserable. It will rather let him live reasonably with yet keep his heart for the Lord. You see, they miss it all. They miss scriptures, if you like scriptures, mathematics on wealth. And so they think we must aim at it. The Bible says, aim at it, you fall. Aim at it, you will destroy your spiritual life. That's what is happening to them. And I dare you, some of them cannot pray real prayers now. Because the thing is, everything is money in their heads. Everything is money. How can they pray? How can they sincerely trust in the Lord, as Hebrews 3 speaks of? So uh, the Bible is very rich when it comes to the teaching about, about wealth, but the warning is very clear. Um, I, I wish that's a, a theme of its own, so we can really survey and you see the riches of it. Hmm. I think you are muted again. A but terrible habit of, again. Okay. Yes, a terrible habit of mine. <laughs> um, I, I think we'll be considering uh, the conversation like this, specifically on this wealth issue, probably tagging health um, and have a, a broad conversation about it. But I, I think that you've answered the question, in my opinion, satisfactorily. Um, so um, please be informed that we're still open to questions. We have roughly 10 minutes to, to, to the end of the um, program and so your questions are still welcome your comments are still welcome like i said this is a roundtable conversation so your contribution is an important aspect of uh, what we're doing here today if you happen to disagree with something please tell us what your disagreement is and so that we can have a brotherly conversation that will lead all of us to a deeper understanding of the word of god this is why we have er so that we can have these conversations um, I'm grateful that you could join us wherever you are. Reverend Bintum is still here. Our brothers, um, Pastor Omaku Chairman uh, is here. Brother Sinachi is here. Brother Joseph is here. A um, few others with us, Brother uh, Prince, who's always um, behind the ones and twos, as we say, is active, um, making things work technically. And I think Brother Enoch was here. I'm not sure, too sure if he's still um, here with us. So, brother, brother Enoch came under fire recently when he was on Good Evening Ghana and he was stating the um, cessationist position on some of these things, the health and wealth, um, I think it's more a uh, health issue that they were dealing with. Um, and uh, I poked my nose some, somewhere into the issues about it and came under a bit of, of fire. I think what we see is that um, the way and manner that these messages has been taught in the church has brought us into um, very entrenched positions. So I can see, I, I always see this resistance to messages like what's being discussed here today uh, from the charismatic side of the fence. I, I, I don't know what the way forward is. Um, people seem to think that so, for example, I hear people consistently saying that cessationists do not believe in in healing at all, when in fact that's not what was being said. I, 
you know, it's been said so many times, it bothers me that people still don't get it. Um, what do you have to say? What can we do? How do we deal with this problem? How do we speak to our charismatic brothers? How do we show them that we're not trying to rob them of something that God, some provision that God has made for them? Because that's this, that's the narrative that God has actually made these provisions and they need to tap into it in order to uh, to to live their God ordained life. I think that's that's how it's that's how it's usually put. Hmm. That is a very difficult question. I think uh, when it comes to the well, biblical given that Reverend, you yourself yeah. came from that kind of a background, yeah. how did this change yeah. for you? you know, sometimes it takes uh, some real yeah. encounters in life to to uh, bring you to that. For me, what helped me, you know, I, I would say fairly that I was very sincere in that. And what helped me, what jolted me, was just a pamphlet. There was a, a certain pamphlet that was coming to Ghana by a group called Every Home Crusade. They, I don't think they are still there now. And mm -hmm. they would, um, two things went with mind, probably because I was in a Baptist church. In my mind, I was having an admiration for the Wesleys, for the Spurgeon and people like those. And yet at the same time, I was involved in charismatism. And so when this pamphlet, I read and saw that they never practiced the kind of things we were practicing. And yet God so blessed their witness. And that's what set me to thinking, oh, I had thought these two things are really interconnected. Having God bless your life so that you live a more Christ honoring life and things like that require these. And this is a testimony of men who taught that these things have ceased. And yet, no one, no one in his right mind can deny they, that they were so useful to God. And that's what set me to thinking and made me ready to question my own uh, experience. So I think sometimes it is, if, if you know, the Lord Jesus Christ gave a promise, uh, if we are sincere, if, if we are not pursuing any idea, you know, friends, it can even be a, a reform persuasion. If I want the reform persuasion only because they seem suitable to my the way I want to live my life, then you will last. One day, something would lure you away. But mm. if there's sincerity, then it may not be just today or tomorrow. Gradually, you'll be brought to a point where you'll be questioning things. Some of them you'll be satisfied, others will be raising questions and then perhaps some progress will be made. So how do we help them? I think we pray for sincerity for them and then gradually insist that please scripture alone, let scripture have a central place then. Because a few persons that we've met that say they want to leave the charismatic church would say that it is when they started reading the Bible themselves. Yeah. So yeah. if we yeah. did that, perhaps there may be some that may be helped. Okay. I mean, I think that from my own experience, what we called Bible study in a charismatic setting is nothing like um, what you see in, in the Christian setting. So I think that people are not really led to know the word in a charismatic church properly, and that could be the beginning of the problems. Okay, that's, that's also dealt with very uh, wonderfully. Well, then there's the issue of vision. Vision casting is, uh, uh, is a huge part part of charismatic thinking. Uh, and I think that men like Peter Wagner, for example, with the church growth idea, may have pushed that particular agenda now where we're now fashioning out visions for churches, much like, you know, we, when you go to church premises, you see the mission statement, you see the vision statement, even on our website, it's all there. Um, what is wrong with vision? Why, why can't, why shouldn't we have visions of our own? Why shouldn't churches have grand plans which they can work towards in, in an, their attempt to glorify God? What's the problem there? I hope by vision, you don't mean the thing when I sleep, I, I, I get or when I see like a picture in my eyes. <laughs> it includes all of them. <laughs> It does include that as we so I actually should have a teaching about vision when I say there's what you see with your eyes and what you see with your eyes closed. <laughs> okay. Okay. Whatever yeah, it, I thought it was profound. 
<laughs> whether you saw pictures or not, it's something you want to uh, pursue. So let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong, generally speaking. The point only is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ gave the church a mandate. If that supposed vision is within it, then we would rather call it an act of obedience. For example, oh, we are planning to want to reach such and such a place and plant churches. Of course, it's okay. Um, but when these things go beyond uh, the, the mandates given to the church, they become human. And when it becomes mm -hmm. human, you cannot sincerely rely on the help of the Lord. The other aspect is how we want to achieve that. The problem with these visions is that it can tempt us to do away with the sincere dependence upon the Lord. For example, mm. if, we, if we plan and say, by the end of this year, we want to plant 20 churches. Suppose we can say something like this. Mm. Anybody who takes scripture seriously knows that for you to form a church requires genuine conversions. Are you mm. sure that if I went to uh, Swedru right now, within next three months, the Lord will bless us with 20 conversions so as to form a church. And then in the next three months, we also go to Ifutu. So we say that you may have the plans, but hold them very loosely. Even those ones that fit into the scripture, like church planting, discipleship, things like that, hold them loosely because you are dependent upon the Lord. The wind blows yeah. where yeah. he chooses because uh, so that otherwise you are tempted. You know, when we in a Baptist convention, there was this, uh, past, I don't know that Pastor Amwako came to hear about that. There was what they were called the Vision 2020. A 2000 mm -hmm. by 2000, so that's a long time ago, 2000 by two, you remember that. And the idea, because in that, around the time we had less than 2000 churches. So the idea was that by 2000, we should have 2000 churches in Ghana. And it was fun in, at every meeting. What pastors were simply doing was simply go to a place, have crusade, how many of you want to accept Christ, put them together. And so one pastor, uh, I don't want to mention his name, he's now an elderly man now. He was pastoring at a church at Tema. And they planted a whole number of churches around the Tema Volta Road. And then just two, three years, Others went and they said that they were only signpost churches. The signposts were there, they gathered the people, they moved probably three months, and then nobody was coming again. Oh, this is to make mockery of the work of yeah. the Lord. Yeah. So yeah. even when the vision fits within the biblical mandate, remember the blessing of conversion doesn't depend on us. We cannot change our heart. It's the work of mm -hmm. the Spirit. This is part of the thing we're saying that with their lips, they talk about the Holy Spirit, but they undermine him. He blesses, he opens hearts, brings them to see their need. And this may take time. We may be blessed with, yes, maybe went to one place. Within three months, we have 20, 30 people to start. With. Another place we may labor there for one year and not a single person yet. We simply watch for what the Lord is doing by testing the fruit because he gives us the fruit to test them. And so th these are some of the things, but to have visions within biblical mandates, surely pastors must have that because they must initiate these things. Hmm. I, I suppose with, with the casting of vision makes um, strategy a necessity. And I think that by engaging in strategy, then we delve into what we want to do and how we want to do things. And even though people say they're praying about these things, they're really doing what they, they want to do. Yes, yes, um, yes. So would you say yes. perhaps it's possible better to say that as a group or as a mission and that's what we say at ministry uh, hope our ministry that we have a mission we are on a mission within god's larger um vision um so we do what he tells us to do or what we believe he requires of us to do on a daily basis based on what's on our hands and we don't have any grand plans and that's yeah. not to say that we don't have a plan we we want to do something but we want to glorify no. god they're making it feel like to say they don't have a plan seems that you are just a hopeless uh, 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 case. But yeah. let anybody say what a servant doesn't have his own plans. He waits on his master to, to tell mm. him what to do. 
And so we exactly. should be satisfied with that. Um, so we know the bigger picture and we want to challenge ourselves to be obedient to that. That's our business. Uh, if we challenge ourselves and are being obedient, we see the Lord himself pulling us to places we never thought we would go. Imagine that we are obedient. We are constantly reaching out. We are constantly teaching truth. Before you realize, somebody said, oh, please, would you come to water and help us with this kind of thing? We have never mm. dreamt about water. But all we're doing is yeah. that if God opens a door, we are capable, we will help. Uh, that willingness has to be there. That willingness to obey, willingness to act has to be there. And that's all we need as servants. And the Lord himself will be pulling us where he wants us to go. Thanks. Uh, I apologize for holding you a little too, uh, a little longer than we're supposed to. Um, but I do have a question. So what would you say to um, people, so brothers in the charismatic community who practice these ideas? So, for example, you take, clearly they are flourishing. They, 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 they control the Christian space now. When you say you're going to church, people think you're going to a charismatic church. Uh, because they dominate, especially our continent is dominated by it. What can we say uh, for the assertion that this is working for them? Um, recently, we heard that a certain big pastor fired a pastor because um, he was not meeting some targets. You know, clearly there's a vision, there's a strategy, um, there's a target even. Um, on pastors and this church in question is one of the biggest on the continent um, they have universities they have private jets they have what have you um, is that not flourishing is God's work not flourishing are they not demonstrating that vision casting and strategy and all of these business ideas that is coming to the church are necessary are useful to further the work of God. When they yeah. fly the private jets, they say they fly them so that they can go and preach the word of God yeah. and get somewhere yeah. else and preach it on time. Yeah. Well, you know, if 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 what if how much they have and the, the number of persons they have should determine truthfulness, then nobody should think the Roman Catholic Church is no longer a church. Mm. Uh, whatever they do, they are wealthier than any of them. And so um that is no question at all. And you know, one of the things we should rejoice over, dear friends, is that God deliberately has designed that faithful churches will never be wealthy. They will have enough to carry out. They will have times of need so they may cry to the Lord and the Lord will come. And when the Lord has given, they will use it to the full. So they won't yeah. be wealthy in the sense of amassing things. And they would always be self-denying um, there's a famous evangelist that used to say, because he would travel to other places to preach and he would go by third class. And they would ask him, why do you travel by third class? And he says that because there's no fourth class. We say that. <laughs> we like say it. that, yes, we say that we cater for needs, not luxury. Um, I mean, ease, a bit of ease is okay. But um, yeah. to really pour so much upon an individual, and that's supposed to be God's money. You know, um, so whatever they will claim, if they are in for something, well, they will give all the arguments. But the raw fact is that, is that the way the Lord asked us to do his work? It is his work. It must be done his way. And then, remember what the Apostle Paul said, so that on that day, on that day, I myself, after having preached to others, I myself will not be a castaway. First yeah. Corinthians right. chapter 9. So, right. dear friends, let's be clear about what the Bible teaches. Labor at it. Should our portion be only a small congregation? Dear friends, none of us is worthy of it to be given even two persons to teach. We need us to be taught. Should God give me 10, 20, I'm honored enough. If he should give me a thousand, well, usually you will so labor that you will feel yourself dying 
if you are a faithful minister. That's what happened to see Spurgeon. And he said that mm. he constantly longed that he had a smaller congregation. Uh, mm. If you think, for them, size is honor. For a genuine minister of the gospel is the fruit that's honor, because that's what his Lord will reward him over, not the size. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We thirst for size, not for ourselves, but for the Lord. Obviously, if there are people perishing, if there are people living in ignorance, we cannot still be happy with two persons and three. However, we say that we would be faithful and leave how many the Lord brings him into his hand. We dare not employ any strategy he does not approve. Because at the end of the day, he marks the books. He checks the answers. Yeah. Um, and we will not be able to deceive him with signboard churches at, at all. all. At all. At all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Bentum. Uh, I think that if we continue, the, you know, there's so many more questions, you know, because of what we've all learned from that. I, most of us here came from, you know, that kind of a background. I was trained as a charismatic minister, so this is what we did all day long. And yeah. so the questions will never end, I guess. Um, in the future, when we have another opportunity, we might come back and talk more on these things. But yeah. for if you're listening to us um, or you're watching us from anywhere else in the world, um, please feel free to share your questions with us on Facebook um, and in our WhatsApp platform. And then we will try and get you the answers. If you couldn't ask or you couldn't think about it now, please send it to us after the program, anytime after the program, and we will do our very best to get you um, the answers. Um, like I said, I still have a ton of things in my head that I would I would like to talk about. Reverend, so we, we will be trying to get you into another program to talk about um your departure from the ghana charismatic convention that's a place where my brother Chim is, uh, um, has recently been uh, ordained as a as a reverend minister um mm. so at the right time i think we'll, we will come back to you for that particular conversation not on this program it's, it's, a, it's a more on a one-on-one -on -one basis so that we can okay. show people um Perfect. what has gone on in the past and what um uh, what the, the the changes represent um, for somebody who's had the experience like yourself. Um, beyond that, I'd like to say that uh, we've brought today's uh, event to an end. And I want to take the opportunity to thank you very much for taking the time and being supportive mm -hmm. of this ministry as usual. I'm not sure that we thanked you enough for coming to speak with us at um, SD21. Uh, SD22 is coming, is around the corner. And uh, we hope which is our vision, if we have one, that is or our mission to bring people to a better understanding of their faith so that they can make informed choices. I think the challenge we have is that most people don't know about the yes. issues. Yes. And so if we have these conversations more and teach on sound doctrine, we're likely to see some changes taking place. Um, so that's the end of today's program. I don't see any questions anywhere, so I would like to ask one of the brothers here to pray for us very quickly so we can bring um, the event to an end. Uh, let me pick on Brother Amwaku uh, It's One of the brothers who have stood with us all through this ministry. We're really grateful for uh, his support. Brother Chemensa, please will you pray us out? Okay, it's probably not um, at his desk. Okay, but I just pray for us and then we, we can go. Lord, thank you. We're really, really, really grateful for what you have done here today. Um, we're trusting that the message that has been shared here by your servant has reached many um, and that they will be touched in their hearts to begin to approach you and your church with the sincerity and the truth that is needed. That, Lord, they might begin to worship you in truth and in spirit. We're trusting, Lord, that you will illuminate them, bring understanding so that they can make informed choices about their identity, given that their salvation depends on this thing. 
We're praying for our brothers and sisters on the other side of the divide, if there is such a thing, that Lord, you will bring them enlightenment as well, so that ultimately uh, your name is what will be glorified. We thank you, Lord, for every good thing that you've done for every one of us, uh, the provisions, the protections, your security upon our lives in these challenging times. And uh, we're trusting that you will continue to do so with us. Um, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, I guess that brings us to the end of to the August edition of EAR. Mm -hmm. um, uh, September is around the corner. We may change what's on our list. I'm very interested in having a conversation about a downgrade um, because I think it's very relevant um, given that we're coming from a reform theology to a charismatic theology. Some of these things have happened in the past and there's been backs and forth, like the Spurgeon issues, his departure from... Um, uh, and then the, the um, uh, not a misunderstanding, but Martin Lloyd Jones's um, attitude towards Benny Hinn and some of what um, George Wif people like George Whitfield and Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards experienced in their time. I think the downgrade will give us a clear picture of what has happened with us also. Um, so we're trying to look into some of that in, in the next few episodes of. Um, ER as we get ready to crown it all with SD22. So if you've been supporting Hope My Ministries through um, what we've been doing here, I want to say thank you very much in every way. I know that we cannot thank you enough. Some of what you do for us uh, amazes me. And I believe that it is the, it's the love for God's work that's making all of you show up here and do the things you do to support us. And so we're really grateful and we, we ask for God's blessing. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Please share our videos in your network um, so that it can reach more people. And um, if people ask you a question that you don't have an answer to, bring it to us and then we'll try and get answers for them. Thank you very much. Good night, That's good welcome. morning um, from wherever you are. Thank you very much for everyone. God bless you abundantly. Bye-bye.